Good evening. My name is Andre Spicer. I'm a professor of organizational behavior and I'm also the dean here at Bayes Business School. I'm delighted to welcome you all here to Bayes tonight. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to say a few words about the Mays Lecture. The Mays Lecture is a key event in the calendar of the City of London uh, and the financial community in this great city. This annual lecture was established in 1978 to honour Lord Mays, a former Lord Mayor of the City of London and also a Chancellor of our University. Lord Mays helped to establish the Centre of Banking Excellence, our banking and excellence, excellence for Banking and Finance, here at Bayes. Since the lecture's inception in 1970, uh, 1978, we've welcomed a long list of acclaimed speakers, including governors of the Bank of England, chancellors of the Exchequer, future prime ministers, a Nobel Prize winner, as well as heads of the International Monetary Fund, the Federal Reserve, and the Bundesbank. I'm pleased to introduce Odile Renabasso, uh, president of the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, who's our May speaker um, this evening. Odile um, Renard Basso was the, elected the President of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development in October 2020 uh, by the EBD, uh, EBRD's Board of Governors during its 29th annual meeting. She is the first ever woman to hold a head of a multilateral development bank position. Prior to this, as the Director General at the French Treasury, Ms. Renard Basso uh, oversaw the development of France's economic policies leading on European and international financial affairs, trade policy, financial regulation and debt management. In this position, she served uh, as Vice President for the European Economic and Financial Committee, Deputy to the G7 and G20 groups at, and the French Governor of, or Alternate Governor of the World Bank, uh, EBRD and the African Development Bank. Prior to that role, she was director, uh, deputy, deputy Director of the uh, Cassis de, 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 de Pos, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Despo, <laughs> a large French uh, public financial institution. Uh, today we will hear Ms. Ranapaso about the greatest challenges fa facing our, financial, uh, our planet, which is climate change and the need to green our economy. She will make uh, practical suggestions as to how we can shift uh, to governments, multilateral development banks and financial uh, service institutions and the private sector amongst others to address this major challenge. Following the speech, uh, my colleague Professor Barbara Kazu, Director of the uh, Banking and Research and Cent Centre for Banking, Research and Finance and uh, Professor of Banking and Finance here at Bayes, will chair a short Q&A uh, with our speaker. Uh, this Q&A will be under Chatham House rules, uh, so please don't directly quote any material from this section. If you'd like to join the conversation on Twitter, please use the hashtag, hashtag Mays Lecture. And at the end of the session, you're invited to stay outside for refreshments and some networking. I'm now pleased please to invite our um, Mays Lecturer for this evening. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, and um, I really, really want to start by thanking the Bayes Business School and City University of London for the invitation to give this annual Mays lecture. It's really a great honour to follow in the footsteps of a distinguished array of chancellors, central bank governors, great economists, two prime ministers, and a president of my own country, France. I also note that I'm only the second woman to give this lecture following Annalise Dodd in 2021. So I'm delighted to play my part in increasing the diversity of the series. Last year's May's lecture was given by the then Chancellor, now Prime Minister Rishi Shunak, on the 24th of February 2022. He, like all of us, had woken up that morning to the terrible news of Russia's illegal, unjustifiable, and unprovoked war of aggression against Ukraine. The Chancellor then said, when the sovereign freedom of one democratic nation is threatened, democracy everywhere is challenged. Ukraine sits deep in the heart of the EBRD 
So I want to start today by acknowledging the suffering and courage of the Ukrainian people and reaffirming the EBRD's absolute solidarity with them. Ukraine is at the core of the EBRD's work and our solidarity takes tangible form, helping the real economy in wartime and in the reconstruction to come. Since the Russian invasion, we have significantly increased our investment there with the generous support of our shareholders and donors. And thanks in large part to this support, including from the UK, we have committed to investing at least 3 billion euros in Ukraine in 2022 and 2023, of which 1.7 billion was already deployed in 2022. But now focusing on the issue of the day. The first May's lecture was given in February 1978 by the then governor of the Bank of England, Sir Gordon Richardson. His topic was the conduct of monetary policy, rather far from my topic today. But he, in his opening words, there is a passage that captures well the situation we are in now. We are now at an historical juncture where the conventional methods of economic policy are being tested. The principles on which we have conducted economic policy since the war are having to be reassessed. Because with changing conditions, we are no longer so certain of being able to achieve what once seemed possible. My lecture this evening is an attempt to examine the twin nature and climate emergencies, a far bigger challenge than the slump of the 70s, to outline why the current economic system is failing, how it must change, and what each of us must do to make that change happen. Let me first set out the crisis we face and its underlying causes. We live in an era in which the dominant influence on the planet is human activity. Let me give you some numbers to illustrate its scale. Of all the mammals in the world, humans and our livestock represent more than 95%. The mass of all the world's bi biomass every mammal, insect, animal, bacterium, fungus, and plant is more than 1,100 1, billion tons. This is a vast number. But it is exceeded by the mass of things humans have made in just the last, the last 120 years, which is nearly 1,200 billion tons. We have made more than 500 billion tons of concrete, 8 billion tons of plastic, double the mass of the entire animal kingdom. The scale of our intervention on our planet is unprecedented, growing and catastrophic. What are the consequences of this? Let me start with the climate. The average global temperature has increased by around 1.2 degrees Celsius since the pre-industrial era. But remember that the average conceals the, the extreme. The temperature increase in Europe has been 2.2 degrees. In the Arctic, it has been 3 degrees. What has caused the temperature to rise? Above all, we have consumed vastly more energy in the last 120 years than ever before. In the years 1800, the world consumed a bit over 5,000 terawatt hours of energy, almost all from cutting down and burning trees. Those facts have been stable for many hundred years, and stayed broadly constant until the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. But by 1900, the world had more than doubled its energy consumption to over 12,000 terawatt hours 
of which nearly half was coming from burning coal. By 1950, global energy consumption had, had more than doubled again to nearly 28,000 terawatt hours. And in 2021, the world consumed 159,000 terawatt hours, more than 80% from burning coal, oil, and gas. This fossil fueled powered energy consumption has resulted in a dramatic increase in greenhouse gas emission, mainly carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, gases that causes our climate to heat. The concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in 1750 was about 280 parts per million. It had been around that level for tens of thousands of years. In April this year, it reached 420 parts per million. And similar upward trends can be observed in mesen concentration. This rate of change is unprecedented over millennia. Its impacts are visible and dramatic. Global temperature and carbon dioxide concentrations have changed over our planet's history. But they never have changed as fast as they are now. And they are doing so far quicker than nature can adapt. Globally, glaciers have lost more than 6,000 gigatons of ice between 1993 and 2019. That equals a volume of 75 lakes the size of Lake Geneva, which is the largest lake in Western Europe. The global mean sea level has risen by an average of 3.3 millimeters per year since 1993, a total increase of almost 10 centimeters over the past 30 years. In addition, extreme weather events like hurricanes have become more frequent and intense. This has devastating impacts for communities living in coastal areas and they represent 40% of global population. Scientists warn us that this global warming can trigger tipping points. These are threshold li thresholds leading to abrupt, irreversible, and dangerous impacts with catastrophic implications for humanity. In fact, recent science indicates that we may have passed some tipping points already. So where are we in our efforts to limit global temperature rise? We are still far from reaching the objectives of the Paris Agreement, which is the most important global climate agreement that set the, the goal of limiting the global temperature rise to well below two degrees and pursuing efforts to keep that rise to only 1.5 degrees. Current policies point to a 2.8 degree temperature rise by the end of the century. Greenhouse gas emissions are a stock problem as well as a flow problem because the gases stay in the atmosphere. That means that we have in effect a carbon budget, a finite amount of CO2 that we can emit before reaching a temperature rise of 1.5 degrees. This budget is about 3,000 gigatons. And to date, we have already used four-fifths of it, which is about 2,400 gigatons. So we have a bit over 500 gigatons left, which will we will exhaust by no later than 2030 if emissions remain at 2019 levels. Achieving the 1.5 degree goal therefore requires global emission, global greenhouse gas emissions to peak by 2025 and rapidly decline to reach net zero by mid-century. This climate crisis 
is just part of a broader crisis that humans have caused. Our planet's ecosystems are beginning, becoming increasingly vulnerable to biodiversity loss, environmental pollution, and land use change and degradation. Deforestation, habitat destruction, plastic pollution in the oceans, overfishing, and unsustainable farming practices threaten the ecosystems that sustain life on Earth. One million species are currently at risk of extinction, and in entire ecosystems, including Amazon forests, the world's coral reefs, and boreal forests, are all fast approaching tipping points. The nature crisis is creating a humanitarian crisis that is increasingly driving the displacement of people into other regions. It affects crops productivity, food security, and the livelihood and well-being of indigenous communities. It has also a significant economic impact. In fact, the cost of ecosystem degradation is estimated at trillions of dollars per year. So how have we arrived in that, at that state? In 2000, the late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs delivered the May's lecture on the subject of markets, governments, and virtues. He acknowledged that the market economy had delivered, at least for the developed economies, a range of, choice, of choices that would have been, only a century ago, beyond the dreams of kings. We can travel the world and communicate globally at speeds unimaginable then. We have better health, longer life expectancy, more access to education and information, than any generations since life first toured on Earth. Those are the achievements of globalized market economy. But that same market has also delivered an economic system which is clearly unsustainable, which is causing impacts on our planet that will, in a matter of years, not centuries, destabilize that very system. How can a system deliver, on the one hand, enormous benefits and, on the other, be the cause of its own demise? Nicholas Stern, whose many achievements include its five years period as a chief economist of the EBRD, gave us the deceptively simple and perceptive answer in 2006. Climate change is the result of the greatest market failure that the world has seen. Fifteen years later, Sir, Sir Parsad Dasgupta, another great British economist, wrote about the biodiversity crisis. It's not merely a case of market failure. It is also a sign of the failure of contemporary conceptions of economic possibilities to acknowledge that we are embedded in nature. We are not external to it. 34 distinguished guests have stood here before me and talked about market rules and prices and how to use the power of these tools to deliver the best social outcomes. This is the first May's lecture to focus on climate and nature crisis. But the same fundamental principle holds true. The EBRD was established in 1991 to foster the transition of the countries in Central and Eastern Europe, post-communist country, to open market-oriented economies. Our funding premise is that well-regulated, well-functioning markets with high social and environmental standards are the best way to deliver public goods. This is why promoting a green transition is at the heart of our strategy. Lord Stern is right. Our sustainability crisis is a market failure. Correcting it requires not abandoning the market, but changing it. 
How? We must change the rules the market works by. If we put values on biodiversity and ecosystem services and impose costs on pollution and consumption, the market will deliver and facilitate the transition to a zero carbon world. Let me outline what this means in physical changes. Broadly speaking, there are, the, broadly speaking, there are four known no's. One, we must transition the energy system out of the fossil fuels. Our use of coal, oil, and gas is a recent innovation. It must also be a brief one. This means two things. First, shifting to use electricity whenever and wherever we can to drive our cars, heat our homes, run our industry, and to produce synthetic fuels for the activities we cannot directly electrify. In the International Energy Agency's authoritative net zero roadmap, global electricity generation more than doubles between now and 2050. Second, generating that electricity from zero carbon sources overwhelmingly from the wind and the sun. In the same EIA scenario, renewables as a share of electricity production rise from 30 to 88 percent, with almost all that increase from wind and solar. At the same time, coal and gas fall from their current position, producing more than half the world's electricity to near zero. Two, we must reverse the tide of, the tide of deforestation. Between 1990 and 2020, we destroyed 420 million hectares of forest, about the size of the European Union. We must reverse that trend by preserving and protecting the remaining intact wild forests, including those in the Amazon and Congo Basin. We can do this by recognizing their value for climate change in international law, providing financial resources to help monitor illegal logging and offering alternative income opportunities to local communities. We must also adapt sustainable management practices for commercial forests and accelerate the, rest of the rate of reforestation of degraded land. Third, we must reshape agriculture. Food production is responsible for approximately a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions and most of humanity's impact on biodiversity. To feed a global growing population in 2050, we must produce 50% more food output with no increase in land use and at the same time reduce the sector's emission by two thirds. This requires decarbonizing inputs, for example, by rapidly converting the nitrogen fertilizers industry to green ammonia, eating significantly less meat, transforming farming through sustainable intensification practices and precision agriculture, and addressing food loss and waste across the entire value chain from farming to transformation, distribution, and consumption. Four, we must manage carbon. Even if we are successful in reducing emissions, we must still emit some CO2 and we still have much in too much in the atmosphere. Therefore, we will need to remove over 600 gigatons from the atmosphere from 2020 till the end of the century. In other words, go beyond net zero to negative. This will entail large-scale plantings of trees and other plants and large-scale technical removals and underground storage. What does addressing these priorities entail in terms of investment and money? According to the Climate Policy Initiative's Global Landscape of Climate Finance, 
global investment needs will range between 4.3 to 9.3 trillion dollars annually by 2030. Yet in 2021, climate finance flows amounted to between 850 and 940 billion dollars. While this is a high time high, it's very far from what is needed, obviously. So, who must do what? Where do the costs and opportunities fall? Can we afford this extraordinary and unprecedented transformation? It is important to recall that the climate challenge contains two quite separate elements, moving to an economic and social model that is both low carbon and resilient. The burden of the first, mitigation, looks quite different in the developed and developing world. On average, on average across the world, each person is responsible for just under seven tons of carbon dioxide equivalent each year. But in high income countries, that figure is 12.5, and in low income countries, it is 2.8. Over time, both, both those numbers need to reduce to zero. But clearly, for rich country, countries, the priority is urgently to reduce the emissions per person. For poor country, the challenge is far more to find a model for low carbon growth to increase wealth without increasing emissions. By contrast, low-income countries are disproportionately affected by climate change. They have less robust infrastructure and institutions, and they lie in geographic locations that are more acutely vulnerable to climate extremes. What does this shift mean in, mean in economic terms? Changing our model in the man manner I have described affects every aspect of our lives and economy. But at the first order of approximation, the sustainable, sustainable transition is essentially an energy transition, a shift from over-reliance on hydrocarbons to an overwhelming reliance on renewable energy. This shift entails major investment. Estimates vary, but there is a consensus that globally, globally this means incremental investment of at least three, billions, three trillions US dollars every year in the coming decade. Those are enormous sums, but ultimately manageable in the context of a world with a saving glut. The Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero identified over $130 trillion of capital available for investment, for example, worldwide. That, that scale of investment will create economic benefits and opportunities. The IAA and the IMF looked at this together and concluded that globally, a net zero transition results in higher economic growth than business as usual. Of course, alongside that economic growth comes a host of co-benefits, less dependence on energy imports, cleaner, uh, more stable prices. And above all, the avoidance of, you, of the huge cost of catastrophic climate change. But that big picture of an era of investment that is both affordable and plausible conceals a number of important caveats. The first one is that transition is a change not simply in the source of energy, but in its characteristics too. It means moving from sources that have relatively low upfront costs and high running costs to sources which have high upfront costs and near zero running costs, and from sources that are concentrated in a few places to sources that are widely distributed. Second, the change is front-loaded. 
the cost of a sustainable transition is not evenly distributed in the next 30 years. It falls most immediately in the next decade. First, because of the urgency of reducing emission I've described before, and second, because of the feature I just described, which is the infrastructure for a low carbon resilient world has to be paid up front. Paid for, for sorry, has to be paid for up front. Third, third caveat, and it's an important one, the distribution of costs and benefits is uneven, both between countries and within countries between sectors and regions. Most obviously, hydrocarbon producing nations and regions will see very significant falls in income. In the decade 2011 to 2020, oil and gas producer economies earned nearly $2,000 per capita. And that will fall to under $400 per capita in 2040s. More starkly, the cost of transition fall disproportionately on poorer countries. World Bank estimates show that by 2030, emerging market economies will need to spend 7% of their GDP annually on meeting their development and climate goals, compared to only 1.1% for upper income countries. Fourth, the shape and plausibility of transition is very uncertain in the long term. In the medium term, the cost and the technologies are now clear. We know that we can at least halve emissions affordably. How we get beyond to that how we get beyond that to zero and into negative emissions is much less clear. So two things can be true at the same time. On the one hand, the sustainable transition can be afforded, at least as far ahead as we can see with some clarity. But on the other hand, it creates very high levels of disruption and transitional costs. For example, McKinsey estimates that 185 million jobs will be lost in the course of the transition. They also estimate that 200 million will be created. In other words, other words net growth in employment, but a great deal of disruption along the way. Who then must do what? It starts with governments. The fundamental role of government is to, say the is, to, is to set the economic signals correctly. That will drive the most efficient transition, the fastest and most effective allocation of capital. Governments must pry negative environmental externalities wherever possible. This includes pricing carbon dioxide emissions. We have empirical evidence from the UK and the EU that a proper price for carbon dioxide drives investment and innovation. Where pricing is too difficult or ineffective, governments must regulate. They must prohibit dam damaging behavior, mandate minimum standards, embed sustainability in their own purchasing decisions and foster new industries. Put simply, they must reward private actions that will help the planet and penalize those which damage it. And they must do this in all parts of the economy, including the financial sector. Increasingly, central banks and regulators are setting the right green policies to influence financial flows. Without such regulation, we cannot hope to see the investment and changes we need. Government must also ease the frictional cost and disruption. And as part of doing so, they must calibrate where the costs fall, both between sectors in an economy and between generations. How much of the front-loaded investment I described should be paid through taxation, how much through consumer prices, and how much through borrowing? Right now, we see different responses to those choice 
playing out in the major economic blocks. In the US, the Inflation Reduction Act will channel $360 billion of tax credit and in incentives for green investments. In the European Union, the Commission is introducing mandates to drive demand, while extending an already meaningful carbon price to more and more sections of the economy. Those are fundamental policy economic choices. And as a former Director General of the French Treasury, I vividly recall some minor difficulties in trying to impose the costs of transition in France. But these choices need to be made. And speaking now as a head of Development Bank, choices also need to be made about transfers from developed to developing countries. We know that donor finance cannot solve the problem on its own. We understand the political context in which it must be raised. But a problem that is disproportionately caused by one part of the world and disproportionately affects another part cannot be solved without adequate flows from the former to the later. The private sector must also respond and its role will be vital. After all, the investment volumes needed far exceed the capacity available for public funding. The innovation required is pervasive and span, spans the entire economy. And at the heart, heart of the sustainability crisis lies a market failure. Addressing that failure will inevitably drive changes in private behavior and flows of private money. Both Rishi Sunak, speak, speaking here last year, and Jonathan Sachs, speaking here in 2000, invoked Adam Smith, noting the power of the invisible hand to achieve efficiency and effectiveness that no central planner can. Private actors must act on the signals and be responsible actors in this transformation. More concretely, they should first disclose, tell their customers, employees and shareholders about the climate-related risks they run and impact they cause. This will empower their stakeholders to be informed, whether as consumers or investors. Second, avoid. Step away from unsustainable actions. Do not contribute, continue with practices or investments that are not consistent with a sustainable future. First, because it's the right thing to do, and second, because doing otherwise is bad business. Third, step up. Invest and promote sustainable business activities. And again, do so both because it's the right thing to do and because this is where the business and growth opportunities of the future lie. Fourth campaign. More than most, businesses have, have an interest in a well-functioning market. It is businesses that should be first to argue for a carbon price and for regulation of unsustainable practices. Lastly, what, sh we sh what should we do? We, as private individuals, global citizens, we as taxpayers, consumers, voters and investors. You may think not a lot, because individuals alone are not able to make emission cuts that come close to limiting climate change to an acceptable level. Yet, I believe that personal action is essential to raise the importance of climate change in society. Ultimately, the impact of humanity on the environment is the sum of all our individual actions. So we each need to look at the different areas in our lives and see where we can make the right choices. These choices can range from switching transport modes to changing dietary habits and opting for investment funds that focus on green investments. 
The list goes on. Reducing waste, choosing sustainable fashion, avoiding excessive travel and overconsumption. As Jean-Paul Sartre said, we are our choices. I have talked so far about the overall picture, the lessons that apply to the global economy and all countries. But of course, I'm the president of the EBRD, and you might want to hear a little about what all this means for development and for developing countries where we work. The EBRD's region of operations, spanning from Central Asia to Eastern Europe and the Mediterranean, face particularly sustainability challenges. Many are still living with a legacy of decades of a common economy that placed no value on environmental externalities. These countries are also marked by over-industrialization, polluted landscapes, and heavy reliance on coal, oil and gas. As a con consequence, the carbon intensity of the economies we work in is nearly double than in the EU. The vulnerability of, clim of climate change of many of our countries become more apparent every year, whether it's wildfires in Turkey, floods, floods in the Balkans, or water shortages in North Africa and Central Asia. All these economies need to accelerate reductions of their carbon emissions and build resilience to climate change. They need to do this to play their part in addressing the climate crisis, but also to ensure their global competitiveness and protect their economies against adverse consequences of climate change. In the last 50 years, access to carbon-intensive economy has been a source of competitive advantage. In the next 20 years, that proposition will reverse. Carbon intensity will make an economy uncompetitive. I noted earlier how large the investment needs are in developing countries as a proportion of GDP. That illustrates the importance for developing economies of attracting cross-border capital flows. However, we see barriers preventing climate investment at scales. One is a limited supply of investable projects, insufficient political commitment to the green transition, onerous administrative and legal processes, and the lack of enabling regulation like carbon pricing do not allow potential return on investments to materialize. To return to my earlier themes, in the absence of proper market signals, capital has limited incentive to move to the right investments. Second obstacle, there are project types that require upfront public financing. And we, yet we often see that government's fiscal capacity to borrow is limited. And finally, the uptake of investable project is limited by uncertainty, risk perception, and macroeconomic vulnerabilities. There is a vast pool of capital in developed markets, some of it perhaps represented in this room. But regulation and investment guidelines make it highly risky adverse. That in turn leads to an unwillingness to grasp the many sustainable and remunerative investment opportunities in developing economies. We often hear that given the unfavorable context for climate investment in our regions, and we as MDBs should be more innovative and de-risk investments for others. I agree with this. A critical role for MDBs is to catalyze the flow of private capital to investments it might, otherwise, it might not otherwise go to. But we need to be rigorous in what we mean by de-risking. If we simply take a risk ourselves and protect an investor from it, we have done nothing to change the underlying problem. We have done nothing to address the market failure that lies at its heart. 
we have only transferred the risk from the market to a public balance sheet. This brings me to the role of the MDBs as a group. Above all, our role is to catalyze systematic, systemic change by using our investments and our policy dialogue to promote regulatory and market reforms that make climate investments economically viable. Central to, the, to that role is our commitment that all our activities should be aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. For the EBRD, this commitment took effect, took effect in the beginning of 2023 and is really transformative. It forces us to look at every activity and every investment through the sustainability lens. Is this consistent with the transition to a low carbon resilient future? At times, this limits, this constraints what we can do. But the much more fundamental effect is to enable us to work in the hard sectors, to engage with high emitting sectors and help our countries make the difficult changes, not the obvious one. We also channel concessional finance from donors and climate funds to early movers in nascent markets to help overcome incremental costs and barriers. And finally, and that's why we are a bank, ultimately, we make crucial investments that kickstart new markets. Overall, our green investment last year represented $6.7 billion of climate finance. Alongside our direct investment, we mobilized a further $10 billion of private capital. So that means that each dollar of EBRD finance mobilized $1.5 of private finance. And I think this is the highest leverage among the MDBs. Yet it's clear and we recognize with other MDBs the need to do more. Many of you will be familiar with the global debate about what else can MDB do and what should, be, what should we done to bridge the gap between what our countries of operation need in terms of sustainable investment and what they currently deliver. I have set out to show that the best and most, most complete answer is a restructuring of all our economies to ensure that the power of market works to deliver the ends we desire. MTBs have an important role to play in that effort, but others, above all governments and their electorates, need to take the lead. But we are very clearly very far from this ideal end state. Even in sophisticated economies, carbon is underpriced, while damaging subsidies and nature externalities persist. And we need to deliver change in the world as we find it not as we wish it to be. MDBs, of course, are used to work to working in imperfect environments and to delivering change in that context. How then will we respond to an even more urgent crisis and the ever-growing needs of our countries? The answers will vary from different contexts and different MDBs but I will identify two overarching themes. First, as I mentioned above, the mobilization of private capital. The money and resources required are simply too large for any public balance sheet. We must persistently identify what holds back investors from sustainable investment and use our skills, our knowledge and our money to break down these barriers. Second, the systemic reform of the economic systems we operate in, creating the enabling environment that channels not just finance, but entrepreneurial, technical, and managerial resources to address the sustainability challenges. To do this, the MDBs need support from the developed world. We need donor and concessional finance that fund our reform efforts unlocks bottlenecks and especially 
funds investment that, that do not have an obvious commercial return, such as in adaptation or biodiversity restoration. MDB can, MDBs can leverage those flows and maximize their impact. We cannot be the source of them. We also need the developed world to create flows of funds along other routes. Crucially, supply chains can be an important transmission mechanism for both climate ambition and funding. Consumers who are willing to pay a green premium, whether for sustainable, sustainably farmed coffee or a car made of green steel, represent both pressure on developing countries to meet those demands and a revenue source to pay for them. Similarly, developed world commitments to purchase high quality carbon offsets can create vital revenue streams for sustainable investments in emerging markets. And finally, developed world investors and finances have a vital role to play. Firstly, by getting their own houses in order. Then, still more importantly, much of the capital accumulated in the developed world must find its way to finance the developing world's sustainable transition. Our request to developed world investors is that they should look hard at the risks inherent in these investments and not simply look for a public or MDB balance sheet to absorb them. Some of those risks are overstated, and we and other MDBs are committed to a greater transparency about our track record in order to help investors get a better, better picture of this. Other risks are real. In countries across the globe, regulations are imperfect and there is genuine commercial risk. But there are also matching returns. And the refusal to engage seriously with those challenges and to work with countries and their development partners to address them is both a failure to engage with a sustainability crisis and a missed commercial opportunity. I noted earlier that two previous May's lectures, Rishi Sunak and Jonathan Sachs, had cited Adam Smith. Both referred not just to the wealth of nations, but also to Smith's first major work, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which cites the power of sympathy for others as a driver for human action. We need a market and finances that are efficient allocators of capital, but ones that also engage with the seriousness of the crisis unfolding around us and the human cost it exacts. Ladies and gentlemen, addressing climate change and restoring nature are the defining challenges of our time. There are market failures of epic proportions that demand urgent and collective action. Addressing them requires changing the rules of the game. The responsibility lies with all actors, government, businesses and individuals. I stand here today as the president of the EBRD. I am also a consumer, an investor, a voter, and a parent. Each of these roles entails a responsibility and offers the opportunity to influence climate action. We must size these opportunities across all our roles because this is good business, because this is the right thing to do, and because we want a livable planet for our children. Thank you very much.